Hello, this is Robert Sanchez, and I'm Assistant City Editor with the Daily Herald Newspaper. Uh, we're pleased to begin a joint interview with the candidates for the DuPage County Coroner's Office uh, in the November 2020 election. I'm joined by Bob Rakow uh, from Shaw Media. Uh, we welcome the candidates, incumbent Republican Richard Jorgensen and his Democratic opponent, Greg Whalen. And uh, we'd like to start with introductions. So, uh, Greg, if you can start, just introduce yourself and talk about why you're running. Sure. My name is Greg Whalen. Um, I am running for corner because I feel that I could take some of the experience that I've gained over the last 16 years in the public safety profession to take the office to a further, uh, further level. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been over 16 years in the public safety profession. I'm cross-trained as a police officer, firefighter, and paramedic. I hold the rank of our entire department. Um, spent a considerable amount of time earlier in my career with the SWAT team. Is Greg Brick up? And I've also had that throughout Greg. my career um, with my department, become an evidence technician, fire arson investigator. Sure. Sorry, Greg, you broke up a little bit there. I'm sorry. It, okay. So can you want to repeat what you said? I'm sorry. Yeah, you might want to just summarize that again because you did freeze up for a bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so a little bit about my past is uh, I have 16 years in the public safety profession. I'm a police officer, firefighter, and paramedic. Um, I hold the rank of lieutenant for the agency that I work for, and I'm also their training officer. Um, throughout my career, I had an opportunity to spend time on the SWAT team, multi-jurisdictional SWAT team that went to a whole bunch of communities in Northern Illinois. I ran the tactical medicine element of that team, where the paramedic integrated with law enforcement. Um, I've also had the opportunity to become a fire investigator, arson investigator, um, evidence technician, um, and have the opportunity to respond to a lot of different scenes, whether they be criminal um, act or civil. i um, also been on, you know, numerous death uh, investigation teams, all the way from fire investigation um, to suicides to, you know, homicides. So I just want to take all my experience and, you know, bring it to the coroner's office and hopefully enhance the overall operations and maybe take a few steps forward and, you know, continue building them bridges and, you know, linking up with our community and being a part of the community. Very good. Uh, Coroner Jorgensen, uh, you wanna introduce yourself and talk about why you're running again? Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, uh, Mr. Sanchez and Mr. Uh, Rakow for the opportunity to participate in this public forum. Uh, this is really important, especially with the COVID restrictions as we have limited opportunities for um, uh, interpersonal reaction with voters. And so this is a valuable public service. So thank you for that. But a little about me, uh, my name is Richard Jorgensen. I'm running for re-election as DuPage County Coroner. Uh, I've lived in DuPage County my entire life. I grew up in Lombard and moved all the way to Wheaton. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Ann, for 40 years and two adult daughters, two wonderful sons-in-laws and two amazing grandsons. I went to Loyola University in Chicago Medical School at uh, Stritch School of Medicine in Maywood and uh, spent five years there with uh, surgical uh, residency. Um, I finished my formal education at Milwaukee County Hospital uh, doing uh, fellowship in vascular surgery. Uh, after that, I went out into the community and I practiced trauma and vascular surgery, mainly at Central DuPage Hospital in Winfield for 20 years before I had to stop doing that due to severe allergies and chemicals and fabrics in the operating room. Um, but during that time, I, I built and administered in a medical office. I had nine surgeons and 25 employees in my practice. Uh, I cared for over 40,000 patients and performed over 10,000 operations. Um, I have extensive experience in science, compassionate, patient, family care, trauma surgery. This all led me to the coroner's office where I've been able to use my experiences helping the citizens of DuPage County. And for the past eight years, I've served as the coroner, caring for the deceased in a respectful and dignified manner uh, and their families with compassion and open communication. 
Uh, I've presided over the administration of this office, and during that time, supervised over 42,000 forensic investigations, 87 homicides, and sadly, 600 overdoses and almost 800 suicides. Um, I'm proud of the work in this office for the citizens of DuPage County, but there is more work to do, and I'm eager to continue the work of administering this office and the issues that have plagued us, such as overdoses and suicides. And lastly, I would like to thank my opponent for his endorsement of my long-held philosophy, principles, and mission statements by which I've guided this office for the last eight years. So I thank you very, very much, and I welcome your questions. Very good. Um, Greg, I wanted to ask you, you ran for sheriff last time and did very well in that race. Why, Greg, why did you decide to run for coroner after making that run for sheriff? So I, I have a passion for law enforcement. That's been my whole career. My, you know, my whole career has been committed to public safety. And in the political environment, there's really only two elected law enforcement positions on the county level. One is the sheriff, and the second would be the coroner. So that's what could draw my interest to the coroner's office. The other part of the coroner's office that's really unique and, and, and interesting in itself is that it's, a lot, it's all based on forensic investigation. Um, you know, it's, the investigations are more technical. Um, so you have forensic pathologists working to help, you know, see things that are going on with the person, the investigation on its own. So it's more of an all-encompassing law enforcement um, function, and it's a critical function in county government, and it's kind of what drew my interest to this uh, race. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, can you talk about what you feel differentiates you from your opponent in this? Sure. Um, happy to do that. Thanks for the question. Uh, I think what basically is uh, I have a lifetime of experience. Uh, I created and ran a large medical office with a revenue of about $6 million. I'm used to administering uh, large budgets and handling, um, handling employees and administering an office. Uh, I also have extensive medical and scientific experience, uh, which is the core of this office. So though we have one of the finest uh, board certified forensic pathologists working uh, for us, the experiences I've had in life and the uh, experiences I've had over the last eight years of running this office, uh, I believe uh, puts me in a completely different standing uh, than my opponent. Greg, I, I did wanna ask that question. Do you feel, um, it's necessary to be a medical professional, to be a, to be a doctor, to be a coroner? I don't. And even the state statute states that the position is essentially open to anyone over the age of 18. Um, but it is a law enforcement position by state statute. They report to the law enforcement training standards boards. Um, so I don't necessarily believe that that is an absolute critical portion. Um, I believe some of the experiences I have, obviously, I can never compete with Dr. Jornson's experience in the medical profession. Um, highly accomplished, highly educated in the medical field and have all the most respect for what he does and what he's done in his past. Um, I just have a different perspective of that experience. I have kind of the field experience, you know, responding to the scenes, dealing with some of the incidents that occur that end up being brought to the hospital and then unfortunately some of them that end up in the coroner's office. Uh, Robert, if, yeah. I, if I could interrupt, Robert, could I just point out that what uh, Mr. Whalen just said is completely false and is uh, the wrong agency to report to. So if he became the coroner, he would be re responding to the wrong agency. And since this is a law enforcement um, office, it is really critically important to know the laws that we operate under. And um, uh, that's a very imp important aspect of the job. Um, well, let me, let me, Let's talk about what you've accomplished, Mr. Jorgensen. You know, looking at the office, do you feel like you've changed the office in any way during the time that you've been running that office? Yeah, I, I um, would, would love to have a lot of time to talk about that. I've completely changed the office. When I came to the office, we did not have uniforms. We did not have education. Uh, none of the deputies in my office were certified 
Um, and we did not have a continuing medical education program. We did not have a wellness program. Uh, and so uh, I, I changed the entire staffing model of the office to allow our employees to be healthier and to uh, the, for their workplace environment. Uh, I instituted a, a training program uh, so that all of our deputies now go to continuing education and training. And every employee, every deputy, including myself, is certified to national standards. Um, some of the other changes I've made, we used to make five and a half thousand paper records. That was a huge waste of time and expenses. And I very quickly, when I came there, converted my uh, office to an electronic record. And then lastly, I'd like to say that when I got there, we were $75,000 over budget. And the first year of my office, I had to actually determine if I was able to function under the budget that we were given. And I was able to corral our spending down to the allotted budget and do more with less. So those are some of the things that I, th that I would say that, that I've accomplished uh, actually quite early in my time. Greg, um, when you look at this office, um, what do you feel is the most important aspect of the coroner's job, in the way you see it? And then how will you handle that task better than uh, your opponent? So the, overall, the, the mission, the whole responsibility of the coroner's office is determining cause and manner of death. Obviously, in order for that to be done, we have to have the employees and the support uh, from within our employees to make that happen. We have to have them properly trained. We have to have the amount of employees we need, the equipment that we need. And understanding that from, you know, knowledge I have recently provided to me that, you know, the coroner's office deputies are currently undergoing contract negotiations right now. And I understand that there's a lot of contentious moments in contract negotiations as there is in many negotiations on the labor management side. But I believe there's a lot of areas for improvement. Um, you know, a lot of areas for working with the overall conditions of work and trying to um, help improve the overall morale within the agency that will help make it more effective. Obviously, if I'm elected, I'll be able to take a look at all the internal operations of the coroner's office that I may not be privy to right now being an outsider. But I'd be able to take a look at that and see what we could do to make things more efficient and um, bring things into the next century, you know, with technology and everything else. So you feel like there's aspects of that office you can improve? Absolutely, because mainly, I, it, I mean, the coroner's role is a management role, leadership role in there. It's, it's a leadership of an agency. I mean, it's essentially a law enforcement agency that, you know, has a task to do, independent of our traditional law enforcement agency. So bringing the experience I have as a supervisor, all the training I've had, training from Northwestern I've had, um, bringing that in there for law enforcement and modernizing the agency and building up a strong you know, rapport with the employees, I think will definitely help bring the coroner's office to a next level. Okay, but, but Greg, is there like a specific, is there one specific thing that you feel like the coroner's office is not doing or, or could do a better job with? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think getting out and communicating with our community that we serve is a huge part of uh, the coroner's office. Um, up coming into this election, looking on the DuPage County webpage, there was only a matter of a handful of press releases. Since the elections kind of gotten closer, the press releases have increased. Um, communicating with the residents, communicating with the people that elect us, I think are an absolute huge part of this job. And I also like to see the coroner's office take things a step further and start working with the preventable causes of death. DuPage has a great Narcan program that's out there right now. Well, let's take that a step further and get some grant money and start supplying EpiPens, um, something that's costly that could save lives. Um, recent state law that got passed, you know, to allow FEPENs, you know, with police officers and stuff like that. That's all stuff that we could do and start finding grant money to make that happen. I have experience writing grants. Um, this year alone, I brought in almost $100,000 in federal grant money to my department. Um, you know, the grant money is out there. You got to know where to look for it and then, you know, work with our other elected partners and do joint operations and bring this together so that we could actually make it in our community. So, um, Mr. Jorgensen, um, any any areas of improvement that you would see in the, in the office that need improvement? Well, I I um I just have to question 
my opponent as to what he's talking about as far as technical improvements. Our office is one of the leaders in the state in both electronic record and uh, its online presence and the IT that we have available. And in response to us getting out in the community, one of the difficulties of you being there and me being here, I have in front of me, I can just show you here, I've got an entire uh, sheet of paper on both sides here of the community uh, involvement that I had last year. It's a on single line on every page. For example, Hope Task Force, going to different meetings, Lions, Rotary, all that type of thing. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I've, I've spoken at two different homeowners association, the Lions of Wheaton, the NACO organization presented my budget at JPS at a public meeting, prevention leadership team, behavioral health collaborative. Um, and then lastly, the press inter interaction. Uh, I, I would say that, I, that I'm available to the press at all times. I have an entire piece of paper here of single interactions that I've had with the press within the last uh, just couple of weeks. And they include national uh, things like NPR, World News Tonight, ProPublica, AP Wire, Washington Examiner, and all of the um, uh, reporters at the Daily Herald recently, um, and the air and press uh, from Chicago. So um, I, I uh, have been very available to the press. I've been very available to community and, um, and, and really question why, why that would be addressed to me as, as I have really, really reached out as much as I can to be available. So, so obviously you take phone calls from a lot of media. Oh. What about the press releases, the number of press releases? Do you think you can, do you want to comment about the number of press releases uh, your office does? Yeah, I, um, basically my, my philosophy on press releases is if there is a uh, single question by a reporter, I will, um, I will answer that reporter. And for example, today, I had two different calls from two different uh, reporters. I answered their questions and directly dealt with it myself. Um, and I, uh, if, if there's more than one question, I put out a press release today because I had two questions about the, the same thing. So that to me means that the press in general is interested in that. Um, one of the problems with the, the comment from my opponent is not really knowing how press releases work in that my, um, uh, we do not leave press releases up all the time. It gets very, very clogged and blocked there. Some press releases like my, ninth, like my 2018, 2019 opioid uh, review, I keep up there all year long because that's critical data to be available to the public. So some press releases, for example, if we had a person who died uh, and, and three months later, there's not a reason to, to clog up our pages with press release. So it's very common for, for agencies to have a, a timeline where the press releases are removed. Okay. Um, Bob, did you have a question? Or? Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> I'll start with um, Mr. Jorgensen. Could you discuss just a bit how the, um, the pandemic has uh, affected your office, what challenges uh, specific to your office it's presented and how you've handled it? Right. right, well, one of the um, uh, most important things that, that I did uh, early on in the pandemic was to try to help the community uh, in planning and preparation. Uh, as you remember early on, there were, there were estimates that we we're gonna lose a million people in America. And uh, so one of the things that I did was to go out and purchase a mobile morgue uh, and the equipment to run that mobile morgue and doubled the amount of, I hate to say it, but storage space for deceased persons in our office. Um, I then called every hospital and every funeral director in DuPage County and kept in communication with the doctors uh, on the different staffs uh, and so, so initially, at least, I did my I did a lot of work involved in trying to prepare the community for the anticipated number of deceased persons. I'm very happy to say that in DuPage County, that never happened. 
we never were overwhelmed uh, and we never had had the uh, amount of deceased persons that were predicted. Mr. Whalen, any uh, thoughts on how he has handled it or how you would uh, add to that, do things differently as related to the pandemic? No, uh, Dr. Jorgensen did what you know, most of the corners were doing across the nation um, when those projections came out. Obviously, the pandemic's not over yet, and I think we still have a long road to go in terms of where we're going. But I think sure your employees are appropriately equipped. I believe there's some ventilation upgrades being done to uh, the corner's office um, in general there based on some of the federal grant money that they got. And, you know, just, you know, making sure our infrastructure and where our plans are in place so that when, when this uh, does to that, they have the ability to operate. Um, the whole psychological well-being of our employees is a huge uh, part of this also, too. I mean, the pandemic's taken a toll mental health-wise across the county, across country. Um, everyone can probably give you some sort of experience of how this pandemic they adversely affect them, whether it be economically, mental health-wise. So, I mean, I'm sure we're paying attention to our employees and providing that assistance if they need it. Um, you know, remote learning, that's part of my life every day with, my, you know, my children. I have five children, you know, three of them in school. So it's a different challenging atmosphere right now, but making sure we're there to be there for our employees and because about being a leader of an agency. If, if I could follow up on that, I um, would like to comment that we have been leaders in the area and noticing trends and reporting to the uh, community. And I put out a public service announcement uh, a month and a half ago, followed it up a couple of weeks ago with our overdose data. And, uh, and I'm just about ready to publish the um, public service announcement for suicide data. And, and this, the sad report that we find is that we've had a 52% increase in the number of overdose deaths in the pandemic uh, shelter in place era and a 21% increase in the number of suicides. So uh, we've tried to put out as many uh, press releases and information to try to help people uh, reach out to people and, and try to help their friends and neighbors who are suffering from, from this, this pandemic. Can I ask, is that something when the pandemic began? Um, did you see that kind of thing as a possible, uh, you know, uh, yeah. result or, or a consequence, I should say? Yeah the pandemic as people were losing jobs for yeah. home the mental aspect that's, just... that's a great question mr Rekha. i think that um no one has pre has predicted this first of all none of us have ever been through anything like this in our lives so so predicting that would be virtually impossible but they one of the unintended consequences of this shelter in place was the tremendous toll that it's taken on the mental health of all of us. And uh, when I, I evaluated every single one of the um, people who died of overdoses and suicides in the first six months of this year, and actually in, in January and February, we were kind of low and, and the numbers were looking good. We didn't have as many overdoses. Uh, but as soon as we got into shelter in place, those numbers went up. And it, as I looked at each one of those cases, there were, uh, there was every single one of them had mental health history, a history of depression, a history of being alone, a history of having financial or marital difficulties, and or being an addict or, or in recovery. So almost every single person that died of an overdose or suicide had one of those factors. So, um, Honestly, that's one of the reasons I put the press release out of the public service announcement, because we need to reach out to the friends and family who are vulnerable and, and try to help them. Mr. Whalen, any further thoughts on that? Uh, other ideas you would have as we, the pandemic is not uh, concluding anytime soon, though we are making progress, but we'll probably continue to see some of these uh, consequences. So. I think, I think the continuous focus just needs to be on, you know, making sure that the mental health assistance out there is available. 
Um, a lot of the times, I think, you know, we see it in the field right now on, you know, the paramedic side of things. There's a lot of people that are extremely afraid to go to the hospital. And they're delaying their care because they're afraid that they're going to go to the hospital or they're going to go to the doctor's office and they're going to be exposed um, to the COVID-19. Um, that, that's a huge part of, I think, where we are and trying to make sure that, you know, the resources there, we're promoting that people use telehealth if they're afraid to go to the hospital. But most importantly, you know, being able to explain to people that, you know, the hospitals and our medical facilities, they're taking their appropriate precautions to keep you safe. And, you know, no one wants to be in the hospital, but if we start delaying care and we start delaying cardiac care, we start to, you know, we don't go to the hospital with abdominal pain or we start suffering, you know, on our mental health element and there's some help that we can get and we don't get it, that's how things start to spiral and go backwards. So we just need to make sure that people know that that option's out there and there's, there's availability to get them to see the medical care, the professionals, mental health professionals they need to see without jeopardizing their overall health and well-being. Bob, I had one other question I wanted to pose. If you mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mr. Jorgensen, maybe you could, yeah. you could start. What, um, could you discuss the coroner's office role um, in terms of education and advocacy as it relates to, um, to our students, especially the, the high school students? We're constantly seeing reports yeah. of um, you know, drugs, uh, vaping, things that they don't fully understand. It's moving much faster than, than most parents can keep up with. What's your role uh, in that area? Well, I'm very proud of, of uh, what I and what my office have done in that, in that area. When I first became coroner, um, I had never seen the amount of overdose deaths as a doctor that I saw when I became coroner. And in 2013, when I was uh, the first year, the full year that I was a coroner, we had 18 deaths in July, one a day, and it just shocked me uh, into action. I uh, started the Narcan program right after that. I addressed the county board, and we started doing educational meetings right away in 2013 and 2014, where I and the state's attorney, a couple of people who were previous addicts and such, uh, went to high schools or around uh, our county and, and some junior high schools. It was harder to get in the junior high schools than the high schools. But um, we, we were very much trying to educate the community. Uh, as I said, I grew up in Lombard. When I was, grew up in Lombard, there were cornfields there. And now we've changed. We're, we're a bigger community and there's drugs everywhere. Uh, it isn't like Chicago, but it's, but it's around. So uh, I and, and a number of my colleagues have been very strong advocates of getting into the community, getting into the schools, and being frank about it. If we don't talk about heroin and fentanyl, uh, they're not going to know about it. They're not going to know that it's a deadly drug. Uh, we had a 15-year-old who died of an overdose, and that's just shocking. So, so uh, that's something that I've advocated for. That's one of the reasons why I want to keep going. Um, there were 38 deaths the first year in, um, in my, in my court when I became coroner. Last year, we had 95. And this year, we've already had 70 deaths in the first six months. So that's critical for us to, to, to get out there and to, do, and to treat this because we haven't, changed, we haven't turned it around yet. Mm -hmm. um, so. Mr. Whalen, thoughts on that uh, in terms of um, students? Drug use, drug overdose, the coroner's role. Oops. Oh, you're back. I'm back. Sorry about that. Something oh, happened. Did you need me to repeat that or, or did you? I don't know if you can hear me on, on your end, but you're. Uh, freezing up on us right now. I'm, I'm hoping that you'll, you know, come back and you can address that question. I, if if I if if he can't speak, I'd be happy to address one other issue that has been really an important issue, um, and that is the the influx of different and new drugs in in the county. Uh, again, when I took over, heroin was the big drug and it killed everyone. Now we have uh, a new, new drugs in the area that they're ingested and they're smoked. 
And, and in 2015 and 2016, we started converting from heroin to fentanyl. And now fentanyl is the number one drug in the area. I actually was one of the leaders in identifying that trend because we were very careful about looking at every uh, toxicology. And I just put out another public service announcement about we've got two new drugs in the area that are now beginning to come into America and, um, and they're, they're being found in DuPage County and we've identified it because we do very sophisticated toxicology tests. So it's really important to keep on top of the science of this and the investigation into how these people die so we know what, what these drugs are in the area. All right, Mr. Whalen, it appears you're, you're back live. Um, would you like to uh, um, address that uh, component? Yeah, could you just could you just summarize the question? I, I missed most of your question. What I had posted the corner, and I'll, I'll post to you as well, is um, you know we're it's a you know I don't know if crisis is the right word, but it's a significant problem in the county and and elsewhere. Um, drug use uh, amongst uh, junior high, high school, parent unawareness, student unawareness. Um, as the coroner just pointed out, that the drug continues to change. It's heroin, it's fentanyl, you know, it's uh, vaping, and you don't know what is contained in those pens. Um, what can the coroner do? What more can the coroner do to, to begin to kind of push back on that problem and, and educate? I mean, getting into our schools, I think, are going to be a huge part of it. Um, go ahead and doing, you know, public education, explaining to our high school kids or junior high kids what's going on. One of the other things I've seen that was really unique out of Will County was, I believe the sheriff's office operates a trailer that's set up as a teenager's bedroom for parents. So it's set up where they would hide all their, you know, potential drugs and stuff that they oh. would have. And that they go to a lot of public events like fairs, you know, you know, street days. Obviously, we're not doing a lot of these right now. But they have these events that are out there and they bring this trailer out there and they go through. It's only for the parents. You have to be a parent to go through there. If a kid wants to go through there, obviously they're not going to go there because they're not going to show them what we know. But it goes through there and then it also starts talking about some of the social media stuff that's out there and teaching parents because social media changes every single day and teaching our parents how that they can monitor their kids' phones and stuff like that so that they can see what they're going into, what they're talking about, what they're getting into, you know, who they're talking about. Um, getting out there, having those different types of public education programs out there in the community and showing that the coroner's office is, you know, out in the community, actually, you know, trying to provide a, some education too on top of, you know, our day-to-day -day duties, I think will help build relationships within the community greatly. Thank you. Since I have the opportunity, I just wanted to ask Mr. Jorgensen, did you ever envision that the job of coroner would include sounding the alarm on these kind of drugs? Uh, well, I think I, I look at it as an opportunity. The, the, the direct answer is no. I, as I said, I was shocked this summer that I took over the office. Uh, to think about losing 18 people in a month uh, was just shocking to me. But it's also an opportunity. And, and I was glad to be in a position to uh, use my medical knowledge and, and my position to... Uh, in, in the community to go to the high schools and, uh, and to try to uh, talk to uh, the community, Rotary, Lions, Kiwanis, whatever we want to, to talk about this because um, it, is, it is a great opportunity to be able to do that and, and sound the alarm. But I, honestly, I never thought that would happen. And obviously, as a doctor, I, I was in the community knowing about that. So... And, and Greg, just to be clear, so, you know, the, you know, Mr. Jorgensen has done a lot of outreach and advocacy about, about the heroin problem. I'm assuming you're going to continue that if you're elected? Absolutely. Um, definitely want to make sure we keep pushing through that. And obviously, the coroner's office takes in a lot of data throughout its investigations. And we see, you know, a lot of trends that are starting to develop. You know, and I think that's huge for identifying the problems that are coming down the road. And, you know, having that ability to see something, you know, that's starting to surface, even if it's a minor trend, it may be something we could act on ahead of time and try to counteract that trend. I mean, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, getting, you know, out in the community and trying to start these programs that could, you know, potentially save somebody. The Narcan program, which is already in existence, pushing the EpiPen program. 
Um, you know, there's big stop the bleed programs out there now that, you know, with all the mass violence that's come up, teaching people how to use tourniquets, which 15, 20 years ago, using a tourniquet on somebody was not a good thing to do. I mean, science has showed us a lot. Our military showed us a lot in terms of preventable causes of death. And I think working together and using multiple agencies to start accomplishing this, joining forces to, you know, acquire funding and putting out strong public service announcements and public service campaigns, I think we could definitely and make a difference and address some of the trends that do occur. Very good. Um, so I think we'll go wrap this up here. I just wanted to ask one question, and we'll start with you, Greg. Why should the voters of DuPage County elect you? The do voters of DuPage County should elect me because I'm, I'm someone that's going to come in and try to strive to improve. I'm not in a status for status quo. Um, I want to improve. I definitely want to improve the relations within the county, improve the morale within the agency. Um, you know, contract negotiations are always the stressful time, and that's be something I definitely like to work with them on and try to help them get a contract that they feel that they fairly deserve, um, and that was a fair contract. Obviously, we have financial parameters that we have to work within, and that's a huge part of everything, but there's a lot of give and take in contract negotiations that we could, you know, hopefully enhance their overall working environment and make them feel that their jobs are secure, that they have nothing to worry about in terms of secure, that we have fair um, and consistent discipline across the board and that our wages are competitive because in the end, the most important part of any agency out there is the people that are out there on the line working. And we got to make sure that we get our people and they're properly compensated, they're trained, and that they want to stay there so that we don't have a revolving door. Because having a revolving door in any agency creates nothing but just, you know, waste of time and training people to go somewhere else. We want to try to make sure that we have that ability um, to, you know, retain our people and use them as the valuable asset that they are. The other elements that I bring to the game is obviously I'm not from the medical profession in terms of Dr. Jurenson's um Experience. I'm from, you know, the public safety profession. So I bring a different, uh, pros, you know, perspective out to the table in terms of making sure that, you know, our investigations are, you know, done, you know, you know, rapidly that we're giving information to the media that may um, need that information. Um, and obviously, most importantly, we're respecting the rights and, you know, the dignity of those who have died and being a resource to the family so that should, you know, they need any help or anything down the line. Um, that they would have that opportunity. And, you know, my family's gone through a situation where we dealt with a coroner. And I have to say, there's nothing but positive that, you know, we came from dealing with the coroner and talking to him. And he was more than open and explaining stuff that helped us, you know, as a family rebuild after the incident that we had. Mr. Jorgensen, I want to give you the last word on this. Um, why should the voters of DuPage re-elect you? Yeah. Well, thank you. And again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. But I think the, the basic answer is that I've had an expense, ex extensive training and experience in my life uh, in medicine, forensics, and administration. And uh, I want to continue this work. Uh, I offer that lifetime of experience to serve the du DuPage County. We have 917,000 people by the 2010 census. Um, and um, and, and it's a huge area. It's a huge responsibility. Administering a multi-million dollar uh, pe uh, budget is critically important, knowing how to administer a budget. Uh, we haven't had the time to talk about it, but as you know, Mr. Sanchez, the county board has told us to uh, prepare a minus 10% budget. Uh, my opponent hasn't talked about how he's going to do that. I have had to prepare that and do that each year. Uh, I'm used to doing that. Uh, I think it's critically important to have somebody who knows how to handle a multi-million dollar budget and a large office, and at the same time have the uh, medical experiences and lifetime experiences that I've had. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes today's interview. I wanna thank our candidates for participating in this discussion, and uh, I appreciate their participation. Uh, good luck on the campaign trail. Uh, the election is November uh, 3rd. Early voting begins September 24th. That will include mail-in voting this year. We encourage all voters to research the candidates and issues in all of the races and uh, to make use of the Daily Herald and Shaw Media. 
as part of their research. Ultimately, informed voting is one of the most sacred obligations a citizen has if a democracy is to flourish. Thank you for watching and stay well. Take care. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.